Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly virtual roundtable where we discuss all matter of things related to the Beatles, uh, their present, their past, their future, and whatever else we can come up with. I'm Al Sussman from Beatle Fan Magazine, and I'm here with my three uh, co-hosts. First of all, the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. That's Ken Michaels. Hey, Ken. Hey, Al. How you doing? Good. How about you? Very good, thanks. Good. And uh, next... You actually, you actually, he actually mm-hmm. sounds normal this week. Yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. I always sound abnormal, right? Right. <laughs> Abby normal. <laughs> Abby normal. In fact, I thought I was coming down with the same thing over the weekend, but I, I shook it, Ooh, fortunately. Cool. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. And next we have, um, I think uh, Alan Cozen called him the uh, the the world's the the world's only remaining full time uh, Beatles journalist. Um, he writes uh, for uh, for Billboard uh, and also for uh, Axes AXS uh, dot com and various other places. And that's uh, Steve Marinucci. Hey, Steve. Hey, Al. Uh, hello, everyone. And our uh, the aforementioned um, resident musicologist, uh, the author of uh, a couple of uh, of Beatles books, and a longtime uh, contributor to a longtime classical music reviewer for the New York Times, and still does uh, work uh, every once in a while for the Times and for various other places. And that's uh, Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Al, and hello, everyone. Well, um, we're going to uh, discuss a couple of things today. Wait, what about me? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we're, we're even now. There's a <laughs> women always I being left me out. Last week. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! <laughs> and our uh, and I'm, I'm no longer referring to referring to her as a as a guest because she really is more of a kind of a recurring uh, contributor to things we said today, and that's. Uh, the uh, the author of uh, songs we were singing, uh, and also of Michael Jackson FAQ, and um, uh, for twenty years, uh, Beatle fans uh, internet editor, and that's Kit O'Toole. Hey, Kit. Hey, Al. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and thanks for reminding me you were there. <laughs> Why do you like Billy? Them? Billy, Billy, Pre- another Billy Preston moment. We forgot Billy Preston again. <laughs> Yeah, I'm the Billy Preston of this group. Exactly. <laughs> last week, last week I was Billy Preston. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So, um, as I said, we're going to discuss a couple of things this week. One is uh, take a look at a uh, uh, an old, uh, kind of uh, somewhat neglected um, album from the solo uh, Beatles catalog. But first have one little piece of, uh, of current business to take care of, and that's an interview that, um, that appeared on uh, the website Super Deluxe Edition within the last week or so. Well, a sort of interview with Scott Roger, who, uh, according to the, uh, the piece, manages, quote-unquote, manages Paul McCartney and other major artists, including Arcade Fire, and who supposedly reached out to uh, Super Deluxe Edition uh, for an interview that actu- for which he did not want to be directly quoted, which is a little strange. Um, so um, so I, actually, I think we should have Steve uh, kind of interpret this. <laughs> oh, you should have t- I, I, I don't even have it up on my screen here. Hang on just a minute. Um... Uh, and if not, I believe Ken does. Yes, I do. When I read this interview, um, there were just a few things I took away from it, because as we know, there's this big controversy about the bonus tracks from Flowers in the Dirt and uh, the fact that it's being made available as a download only instead of on CD. And a Mm -hmm. lot of fans are very upset about that. So this is something that was addressed in this interview, as well as some other questions that I thought were not softball questions <laughs> mm-hmm. very, very good questions as a matter of fact but sure um i thought maybe i would just read uh the answer although he did say don't quote me word for word here exactly 
the question, why not include the download-only content on a physical fourth CD in the Flowers in the Dirt box set? So what he says here is, the main reason why there is not a fourth physical CD is because Paul didn't want any more than four discs in the set. What Paul says ultimately goes. He wants to look into the future and embrace new technology and drive people to streaming. A hundred million people are signed up to streaming services right now, and that is projected to double in the next three to four years. This is seen as the future. Paul's team wants to look to the future, and their research shows that more people are excited about the streaming catalog. If that wasn't the case, then many more box sets would be sold. That's the mm -hmm. end of the quote. Interesting. Yeah. Ooh. In in fact, uh, you know, kind of well, maybe reading more into it than, than is actually there. I have a suspicion that in the future, because obviously there's four, there's still four McCartney albums from the '70s, four Wings albums. Uh, Wildlife, Red Rose Speedway, London Town, and Back to the Egg, which still have not gotten the archive treatment. I have a I have a nagging feeling that reading those comments that in the future what may happen is is that the only physical content on these sets may be besides you know whatever books and all are included may be just the main CD and the rest of the supplemental material may not, not only be you know not downloaded but available only through through streaming that's possible yep mm -hmm. I certainly hope not yeah I hope yeah. not too I have a feeling though I mean if you want to read between the lines when he says yeah if this were not the case that more people are interested in streaming which by the way I don't know what their research is and what their research regarding McCartney's particular listeners is, but mm. um, I, ha I have a hard time believing that most of those people are uh, increasingly interested in streaming. But when he says, if that were not the case, more box sets would be sold, is basically what he's saying is, we're not selling that many of these things. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's probably also why he doesn't want to be quoted directly because Paul doesn't like other people speaking for him. Right. Um, I ran into that uh, when I wrote about the Russian album, you know, uh, for the Times when it first came out. We, um, we were trying to get an interview with Paul about the album and why he did it, and he was working on Flowers in the Dirt and. Richard Ogden, his manager at the time, said he couldn't do an interview quite yet, but, you know, eventually. And I said, well, you know, why don't we talk if he's busy? And and so Ogden and I had a conversation about a number of things, including um, why he did that album and, you know, all about Glasnost and, you know, the whole story. Mm -hmm. And while, while I was at it, I said, so by the way, you know, why is it that he is putting out all of these singles with B-sides that are available only in Japan or, right. you know, you've right. got to buy five different versions of the single to get all the B-sides. It gets kind mm -hmm. of expenses. And, uh, Ogden's response was, you know, you sound more like a fan than a New York Times critic, so what's going on? And I'm, I'm saying, well, are you saying that a New York Times reporter should not know his subject inside and out? Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. And basically, in the end, you know, we went back and forth for several days, and finally my editor said, well, you know what, just write the damn story. You know, forget it. If he doesn't want to talk, yeah. he doesn't. So I wrote the story, and I had all these comments from Ogden, none of which were off the record. Uh, and because I quoted Ogden and not Paul, apparently there was uh, quite, a, quite a number that went on because Paul doesn't want someone speaking for him, and Ogden was in the embarrassing position of having spoken for him. Ooh. So he sent me an angry fax telling me that... Um, the comments were understood to be off the record. 
And I said that for them to have been off the record, that phrase must be uttered aloud. <laughs> uh-huh. um, you know, and in fact, it must be said before you make the comments. And we never, ever discussed off the recordness. You know, it just wasn't. Um, so I have a feeling that when this guy is saying, you know, he, this isn't an interview and he doesn't want to be quoted. Yeah. It's partly because of that and especially because of he's going to be saying things like, well, if this were true, more box sets would be sold. It kind uh, of is not something uh, he probably wanted to be quoted saying. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? Very possibly. Yeah. Very possibly. And, uh, and, the, and the, the other thing is the, uh-huh. whole, is the resistance to streaming. The, the whole, you know, look how long it took them to get to iTunes, although McCartney McCartney was was doing um, you know uh, digital before the Beatles were, but mm-hmm. I mean, but it's still, I mean, that uh, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, I don't know, I don't know what I mean, especially if his fans, which are you know basically older fans, are more uh, you know are happy happier with CDs. I don't see what the problem is. You know, I don't understand. And again, as I said before we started, he had room on the set to put those tracks. Yeah. There's, right. no, there's no reason not to. Absolutely not. Right. You can make all the excuses you want to, but that sticks out like a sore thumb. Yeah. And to say that but, Paul McCartney wants to, quote, drive people to streaming, I mean, does that sound true to any of you? Well, not, I'm not, not if you have room for CDs. No, not, not if you have room for the tracks. It sure as hell doesn't. No. I mean, if, uh, if 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 this thing was overloaded, that would be a different story. But uh-huh. it's not. It's not as it, as Paul's reissues usually aren't. This one has a little more than most. I mean, we've talked about we've talked about the issues with 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 his with the reissues before not having very many rare tracks this one has a few more but still he could have done i mean look look at what dylan did look at what the beach boys have done you know look at we were i was just talking about the the allman brothers with the 1971 film maurice concert they just released the whole thing the whole all was it six cds worth you know or actually that came out last year but still that's out there i mean McCartney's not doing, uh, you know, I, I, you can't say he's being charitable. I'm sorry, you know. You well, can't. on the one hand, this is admitting that these box sets are not selling well. Mm-hmm. So maybe you can look at it this way. He doesn't have to put this stuff out at all. And why should he if it's not selling well? You know, so I think he's doing this because he still wants to do this. He wants to do this for the limited fans that care enough that want the bonus material and who actually care about all the, the photos that come with it, all the booklets that come with these archival releases are really nice. You know, so he's continuing doing this despite the fact that there is a limited amount of interest in it. Mm-hmm. So this is how he handles it. And just to address what you just said, Steve. There's a question here, and this is why I like this interview, because like I said, there's, there's some tough questions here. I think everything is addressed in this, in this interview that any McCartney fan who's bothered by all this would want the answers for. And the question is, if there isn't a market for multi-disc sets, how come Sony issued a 60-disc box set for Elvis and a 36-disc set for Bob Dylan? So the answer here is, this is a different prospect. Scott agreed, the manager, that there probably is a market for a 25 CD set of Paul McCartney and Wings, and MPL could do that. Indeed, they are talking about it. But for one title, one album, it's different. Hmm. And that was the response mm-hmm. to that. Um, I'm, I'm not buying it. I mean, I'm not buying it. You know, this whole thing about you know, talking around the interview and everything like that, it just, just doesn't make sense to me at all. Just doesn't, just doesn't. As a you know, as a journalist, I just I don't appreciate that. Well, so. let me ask the uh, let me ask the internet editor here, um, <laughs> and who is also in a in a, in a younger demographic, because <laughs> yeah. obviously there's you know I, as you know there's a lot of opposition to just to downloading, um, let alone streaming among 
you know, a, a large section of the Paul McCartney constituency, which is, you know, an older, you know, an older demographic, as they say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, the, the future really these days, would you agree, is really more in even more so than than downloading is in streaming. I, I think so. I mean, you know, it, it, with people my age and definitely younger, they are very comfortable, you know, with uh, download. Well, certainly downloading, but particularly streaming, because, you know, look, at they're not listening to their music, you know, on, on really on stereos anymore. It's mm-hmm. all, you know, through the phone, through, you know, maybe your computer, uh, but mainly, you know, phones or or if you have the, you know, Spotify in your car or something, you know, and they like being able to store their music, you know, in the cloud so they can access it anytime they want. Um, And that's been very important, I think, to younger generations. And so probably people like that are not going to be bothered by uh, having to, you know, only get it on a stream or, or downloading it. And in fact, I was going to say earlier, Al, when you were saying you were, you suspect that future uh, archive releases could be, mm-hmm. you know, strictly online, certainly that would be in a way attractive to Paul because let's face it, a lot cheaper to do that than to actually have to produce. It is. You know, I mean, I, and I know we all love it, but I'm just saying, you know, if you're just looking at it from strictly a business standpoint, Mm-hmm. Yeah, much easier and cheaper to put it out that way than have to put out a physical product, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I I think probably younger, you know, quotes, younger fans won't really be bothered by this, by, by downloading or, or streaming. But I definitely see with, with the case of Flowers in the Dirt, with this price tag, you know, that's, that's on it, mm-hmm. I can see why... There is, you know, there's this issue of why, you know, why does some of it have to be downloads, you know, Mm -hmm. as I said, with that price tag. If it didn't have that price tag, it wouldn't bother me as much. And actually, the price tag went down. I don't know if you noticed. Oh, no, I didn't see that. It it was $149 before, and now I believe it's $119 if you go on on Amazon. Really? That's uh, that's still not super cheap, you know, so... Mm -hmm. But that, I mean, that's a little better. That's that's true. But uh, yeah, maybe they finally realized that they had priced it a little high. I don't know. But but I can definitely see, like Steve, I can see your point. You know that that there should be. I mean, it shouldn't be all downloads, uh, or that's not all downloads, but it shouldn't be that many. Uh, that it should be more CDs for that kind of a price tag. Yeah, I mean, if, well, I mean, especially if there's if there's room on there, I mean, fine. You know, there's no n- need to put people out, you know, to do the downloads. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And like we've been saying, you can most likely fit all 18 demos on one CD. So if he's concerned mm-hmm. about only putting out four discs, you can still do that. Yeah. My main concern, and I expressed this before when we first heard about this, is that you're giving all this bonus material lower status than the mm-hmm. demos of Paul and Elvis. And there are a lot of people that love all this extra stuff that came out at that time. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there are people who love these songs that mm-hmm. came out. And, um, you know, to say, well, we'll just put it out as downloads, it's kind of like saying it's not as important as the demos. And that's mm-hmm. how I feel. Not only that, but there was a response that I got online on, uh, on my Facebook page. One of my friends said to me that, yeah, I can download these songs and I can put them onto CD. But a CDR yeah. is not going to last as long. Exactly. As a, as right. A recorded yeah. CD. That's and that's so, very true. Yeah. You know. And that's and that's the that's really the major argument is that, you know, you can you can, you know, take the time and and do that. But yeah, I mean, I've had you know I've had stuff on on CDRs that, uh, you know, has died. You know, yeah, uh, I, you know. I have I have CDs, CDRs that I recorded oh ten or ten or fifteen years ago, that will not play now. Mm. Mm. Well, so. I have I have company made CDs that have gone bad too. So it's it's mm-hmm. not it's, nothing is uh, guaranteed. There was this uh, situation called bronzing that happened for a while, depending on the kind of ink 
the whatever record company was using. Oh, right. And it, it affected yeah. RCA, it affected certain British labels, um, and some of those CDs are, are not playable now. So I don't know, and I, I've had less problem with CDRs than with those. I mean, the only CDRs I've had go bad have been because I put um, labels on them. Yeah. You know, before, oh, really? Yeah, really? because the the labels, uh, certain certain label adhesive material yeah. would start to shrink, and it would, mm -hmm. uh, you know, pull they wrinkle. On the, yeah, it would mm. pull on the CD. It would pull the mm -hmm. the data layer off, and uh, right. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I, I never, had, I never heard, never heard of that one. Um, oh yeah. I, I, there was. I remember. Uh, either posting or, or seeing something about it a few years ago, there was a way to actually preserve CDRs uh, or yeah, CDRs uh, that uh, had started going bad. But I can't. It's been so long now. I can't remember the the way to do it. But um, yeah, I mean, there's there's. It's just ridiculous. It's stupid. Well, one further thing I'd like to say mm -hmm. on this is that it, yeah. it can't be that easy. To determine how to handle this, only in the sense that, you know, you've got CDs, you've got downloads, you've got vinyl. Mm -hmm. How much do you make of each? I mean, how many do you press of each? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It should be, they really should know at the record company how much of a demand there is yeah. overall. And, and how much is selling of CDs and how much is selling of vinyl. Mm -hmm. You know, vinyl is another issue because, you know, I keep hearing that, that vinyl is just growing and growing right now. And, and I see it. I see it firsthand at a job that I work at, where they don't carry any music. They never did, and, and all of a sudden they're car they're carrying albums. Mm -hmm. They're carrying vinyl albums, mm -hmm. and there's more and more of a push of that. I saw an article where over in the UK, vinyl last month or two months ago actually outsold CDs, mm -hmm. but it didn't outsell downloads. So no. how, how much do you make of vinyl? How much do you make of CDs? And how much do you make available as downloads? It's not yeah. easy to determine how much – well, downloads, what? There's no work in that. No, right. <laughs> but, but hopefully McCartney's team and the record company knows how much it would sell. You make a limited quantity so there's no loss. Mm -hmm. And if it just so happens that it outsells that quantity, you make more. Mm -hmm. So that's you know that's how I see this gets resolved. But I really don't like any of the people. Most people who buy Paul McCartney's albums are of an older demographic, as right. much as I hate to admit it. And those mm -hmm. people do want physical product. They want to see a photo on yeah. the CD in the packaging. Maybe there's lyrics, you know, yeah. something associated with the packaging of those songs as they came out from CD singles, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. People want that. That's also part of the appeal of vinyl. They want to see photos. They don't just want something that goes onto your hard drive <laughs> and, and you know, you press it onto CD. And the, to me, that's very impersonal. That's very cold. I want to hold something that I know what the artist looks like when I'm buying it. You know, maybe yeah. there's lyrics. All that matters. And, and certainly to, to all the first generation <laughs> Beatle fans, that should matter. Mm -hmm. That's how we were brought up. <laughs> you know, if, if you don't mind doing the downloads, then fine. But I want something substantial more than that. I want it to be more of a personal experience when I buy this stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, for all that money, it should be. Well, yeah. you know, the, the fact is all that money, I mean, all that money has to do, I believe, with the production of these box sets as box yeah. sets with the booklets and with the photos. And right. if it were just for four or five CDs – it would cost it, you know it would cost 50 or 60 bucks you know and, and why is why is sony more willing to do a 36 cd dylan set or a uh, how many cds was the elvis set 60 60 why, yeah 60 why why is sony so much more willing to put out huge sets like that I don't, don't know. know. But the thing is, you know, if they're if they're worried about it creeping up to the next price point, the fact is the price point isn't being governed by the number of CDs. It's being governed yeah. by the lavishness of the books. And I love the lavishness of the books. I mean, I'm happy to I'm happy to buy those sets. And, you know, I don't think that adding another CD would make it 
that significantly more expensive. And as Ken pointed out, you could combine the demos onto one CD. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. None of this makes sense to me. And, I, and it's being attributed to Paul, but I kind of don't think that he is sitting there saying, no, I will not have it be more than five CDs. I mean, wasn't RAM five discs? I don't know. I don't no. remember. The no, set. there were there were four. There were four. You know what? Why? What is the magical number of four? Uh, you know, in in, in these mm -hmm. reissues, what does that mean? Like, mm. who who cares? You put out as many as you need to do the job, right. and, and the job in this case includes a whole lot of B sides and things that are now being just downloads. And you know, I, I mean. I have mixed feelings about the downloads. I, part of me doesn't care because um, I'm going to store them on a hard drive. I might mm -hmm. burn a CD right. if I want to burn a CD. If I think my CD is going to go bad, I'll burn another one in five years. You know, uh, the hard drive can go bad. I mean, there is this this question of whether there's any permanence in the stuff you're buying now. But, uh, right. but uh, as I say, that can happen with a factory press disc too. And the thing is, I guess maybe they're thinking, okay, if a, if a person is buying this set and they're, they're still going to get the packaging, they're still going to get all the pictures and all the stuff. It's just that they're going to get these extra, what is it, 18, whatever it is, number of tracks as mm -hmm. downloads. And, you know, okay, I, I just think that, you know, it, it wouldn't have increased the price that much to do an extra disc. And it looks mm -hmm. nicer and it makes it more of a – a complete set, you know? I mean, it's a complete, mm -hmm. the complete job yeah. is this is the reissue. It's in this box, mm -hmm. not it's mm -hmm. in this box, but there's also some on my hard drive, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And not only that, not everything that was a bonus track at that time is on this collection anyway. So it's not complete. Yeah. Right. That's true. Yeah. Ooh. Which always seems to happen. Yeah. Yep. It yep. always there. does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> indeed, indeed, because I remember that there was that uh, that Japanese uh, right. version of Flowers in the Dirt, which I believe did have all of the the stray tracks, and several of which are not are not on here. Yeah, in any form. Mm -hmm. So I guess we will uh, we'll we'll just uh, we'll see what happens uh, come uh, come March twenty fourth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, in the meantime, we're going to uh take a take a trip back in time to visit a um as I said a, a relatively um relatively neglected album from the uh from the the, the solo catalog. And uh, it's uh, it's George Harrison's uh, Somewhere in England. And I have in front of me uh, the June, July, 1981 issue of Beatle Fan Magazine, and we had in that issue three, actually three reviews of uh, of Somewhere in England. Uh, one by Bill King, who concludes his review by saying, "Listening to the Harrison of today, you may find it hard to believe that this is the uh, the same guitarist who once rocked out on such numbers as Roll Over Beethoven." But while his ties to rock now may be tenuous, Harrison proves on somewhere in England that he still has a knack for putting together uh, pleasing melodies and vocals. And there's another review by uh, Sean Fulper Smith, who was a familiar name for people who were readers of Beatle fan in the early days. And he says, uh, despite the fact that Somewhere in England is uh, is pieced together from uh, from an abandoned project last year, it comes through as a cohesive set of songs that are both uh, thought-provoking and musically superb. And then there's another review here. <laughs> um, this one says... Uh, George Harrison did indeed give Warner's uh, a more uh, saleable product the second time around, but with this album's lyrical content, he creeps closer to becoming rock's ultimate BOF, boring old fart, <laughs> and concludes, if you, uh, if you take the best moments from Harrison's last three albums, you have one great album. Unfortunately, when one uh, releases an album 
only every two years or so, four or five good tracks just isn't enough. And those are the good parts of this review. <laughs> who wrote who, that? Who, who wrote the hell? That? Who the hell wrote this? We're, ne- we're never going <clears> to <throat> have him on the show. <laughs> who the? Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> that was me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and you should have seen the mail. In, in fact, in the next issue, if for people who are lucky enough to have the bound, the, the two bound volumes of Beatle fans' first four years, or who indeed have copies of uh, uh, of those early from those early years in the, uh, I guess it would be the August September eighty one issue, there are several letters that take issue <laughs> with my review. Mm. So. I think it's probably time to uh, to take a uh, to take a kind of a a more a more mature look at <laughs> at, the, at this uh, at this album. And Ken, why don't you give us a little background first of all on somewhere in England? Well, it was the album that came out after John's death, but also when uh, George put together this album. He had a different lineup of songs. He had four songs that didn't make the album because the record label, Warner Brothers, didn't feel that they were good enough. Right. And I think more people talk about those four songs than they talk about the actual album itself. Mm -hmm. Because those four songs are all very strong. In fact, the one song, Flying Hour, um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) is a song that's been requested on my show. (laughs) Uh, It's, uh, you know, it's amongst the most requested and certainly in my days on WDHA in New Jersey, um, because it has a lot of commercial appeal to it. And why on earth Warner Brothers would ever turn that song down, yeah. I will never know. Because, I know, it's a fantastic you know, it, song. It could have made a good follow-up single from all those years ago, much more so, at least in my opinion, than Teardrops. But yeah. um, those other songs, those other four songs, have either been released commercially or they've come out through the Genesis books of George Harrison, the songs by George Harrison that came mm-hmm. out. But, um, yeah, this was the album a lot of people, kind of like with Tug of War, were waiting to hear what George had to say, his first album after John's death. And so mm-hmm. um, he had to make these changes with the album. And, um, you know, all those years ago proved to be a big hit, going to number two in America. But the album itself only went as high as number 11, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the Billboard charts, and it didn't have a long, long chart life. So uh, the public really didn't take too well to the album. And um, beyond that, what more? What more can I say about you know the the public and the way that they responded to this album? Yeah. Okay. Now it should be it should, it should be added that you know the number eleven uh, on Billboard's um, uh, album chart. You know now. You know, the, uh, for a an album by a Beatle to get to number eleven would be a huge triumph. But at that time, a number eleven was considered to be a subpar performance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry, Alan. Mm-hmm. Especially yeah. considering that there was anticipation for yes. anything from from the ex Beatles after John's yeah. death. True. Yeah. So I have a question for Ken. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did Warner object to those four specific songs, or did they re- did they just think the album could be stronger? Because, I mean, today as well, I was listening to the album plus those songs, and I, I found the four supposedly rejected songs to be among the strongest in, in, in the, mm-hmm. the whole thing. Yeah. And so it, did they really object to those specifically? That was my understanding. I could be wrong on that because, I mean, Blood from a Clone, that song really does explain George's frustration with the record company right there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, all you got to do is read the lyrics of, of yes. Blood from a Clone, and it, it does explain how the record company doesn't really know what they want. <laughs> you know, they, they really want more of the same thing, which is what Blood from a Clone is yeah. all about. Yeah. They don't want well, the changes in the music industry. They don't want new wave. Right. They don't play that crap yeah. and all, all that. Mm-hmm. So here was George, really. I mean, those four songs that were left off of Somewhere in England were very similar to what he'd been doing anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Flying Hour, which, which in fact was recorded in 78, 
uh, could have easily have been on the George Harrison album of 79. Mm-hmm. You know, so it was it was really more of the same. So I can understand George being very um, upset with Warner Brothers at the time because, mm-hmm. you know, there's always that that prevailing attitude that the record company doesn't know what they're doing. Right. You know, <laughs> and you either continue doing what has worked for you all along and stick to your guns. And that's really what George was doing anyway. Mm-hmm. And then if they don't like the material then how can you complain about that when you're giving them something similar to what you've been doing anyway? Right. I so, think I think Blood well, from a Clone was just a brilliant response to having his album rejected for the yeah. reasons they gave. It's like, oh, okay, here, how about this one? You know, I mean, I, I'm amazed that they put that out because of, of the it, – it's basically standing up to them. Right. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking the same thing that I, I'm amazed that the record company said, "Oh, this is this is much better." <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I wrote an article for the last issue of Beatle Fan about uh, George Harrison's '80s years, and of course looked into right. somewhere in England, and I found uh, an interview that that George did with Cream in 1987, and that he told uh, the interviewer about somewhere in England that the company was telling me, "Well, we like it, but we don't really hear a single." And then other people were saying, now, look, radio stations are having all these polls done in the street to find out what constitutes a hit single. And they've decided a hit single is a song of love gained or or lost directed at 14 to 20 year olds. And I said, shit, what chance does that give me? (laughs) I don't know. I don't know if this is an accurate source or not, but the review on all music by Richard is it Janelle says that Warner Brothers specifically rejected the four songs. Okay, which doesn't it doesn't totally make sense to me that they would reject those four songs because you know, I mean they were great songs. I I'm my feeling is that that I mean my guess is that they rejected the album and he reworked them and and then you know and added the four songs that he did. But I, I can't see them rejecting those four songs. I mean, the the stupidity stupidity of that. Uh, um, I, w- I won't use any current uh, um, comparisons, but uh, I think there's a there's a current comparison there. Um, but in any event, um, but yeah, I mean that's just ridiculous. It just makes absolutely zero sense. Um, <laughs> no, but yeah, those those are such those are such great songs. Flying hour. Lay, uh, you know, lay his head. Lay his head is a beautiful yeah, song. And, and actually, actually, uh, they came out on on bootleg before. You know, they they, they found the uh, copy of the, the the original tape and put it out on bootleg, plus on vinyl, and then on CD. So yeah, I, it was out there. They were out there before the Genesis, um, and the iTunes reworkings. Uh, hmm. Yeah, so. I'm just saying commercially they came out that way. Right. Yeah, and even with the the case of Leia's head, the original version is different from what officially came out anyway. Leia's head became the B side of "Got My Mind Set on You," and it was mm-hmm. reworked by Jeff Lynne. Mm-hmm. I always loved that song. Yeah, <laughs> really gorgeous tune that is. I agree. And you know, there's a lot of hooks on all four of those songs. And I, I just to be realistic, I mean, music was changing in the late '70s to the point where a song like "Blow Away." Which to me, I think "Blow Away" should have been a number one hit. Yeah, "Blow Away" had all yeah. that commercial appeal, and went as high as number sixteen. Mm-hmm. So, to be realistic, I'm not saying "Flying Hour" would have been a number one hit, but it probably would have made the top forty. Mm-hmm. So, it would have given the album some legs. Oh, to me, it deserved to be much more than top forty. But mm-hmm. I do think "Flying Hour" would have been a much better choice than anything else that that was on the actual album. Well, I mean, I uh, actually about the only about the only good thing that I said in this review was actually about teardrops, mm-hmm. which I thought and still think, even listening to it just today, I I don't understand why that was not a successful single, and it was. I mean, it was hugely unsuccessful. I mean, it, and, you know, I uh, I don't have the the. Uh, chart data in front of me, but uh, I think, if I recall, I may not even have made the Billboard Hot, uh, Hot 100. Uh, I, gotta, I gotta try and remember that. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, if or if it did, it was very low. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and yet, I've 
I, I still think it's it's a you know it's a very accessible commercial pop tune. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Another um, song that I, I thought was interesting, you know, I, and I looked this up on, on Spotify today, and I mm-hmm. and obviously the statistics have changed, but I found one of the, the more popular um, songs that was being streamed uh, by, you know, when you go to the George Harris page, uh, was Life Itself. Mm. Um, yes. And I think that song has aged very well. Yeah. Um, I think that's one of his finest songs. I, I think it's a, it's just mm-hmm. a beautiful expression of, of his spirituality. I'm not saying that would have been an enormous pop hit. You know, I mean, probably not. Uh, no. But but I think it's definitely a standout. Um, and, and as I said, I just find it interesting that that song seems to be getting more and more, you know, renewed attention uh, as the years have gone on. And for me, that's always been a highlight of, of Somewhere in England. Mm-hmm. And it's also interesting that there are two Hoagie Carmichael songs on the album. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah. it's funny, I was watching um, I was watching To Have and Have Not um, a couple of months ago, and there in the middle of To Have and Have Not is Hoagie Carmichael singing Hong Kong Blues, the, yeah. the, the composer. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, um, but, uh, I, yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, Inter- who would have thought George Harrison was a Hoagie Carmichael fan? Although, I mean, he loved he he loved obviously he loved that kind of music. Uh, yeah. Oh sure. Oh yeah, it makes oh, sense. Absolutely. Musical. Right. Yeah. Well, you find out a lot of that stuff through the solo careers of the Beatles. Yes. Right. I mean, just the fact that George covered "True Love," yeah, which was a Cole mm-hmm. Porter song, and he right. also covered "Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which uh, Cab Calloway had a hit with uh, 1930, I think it was. Yeah, everybody. So, everybody usually gives McCartney the you know the the depth on on the uh, you know on that kind of music, but George was there too, uh, very much there. Um, well, actually, both uh, I guess both George and John were kind of closeted, you know, British music hall fans. Yeah, <laughs> you know, George Formby. You know, they were both right. uh, big fans right. of George Formby. Mm-hmm. Right. That's another. Yeah. There's another. That's another name. And four well, I mean, how can sure. you not say all four Beatles are? Well, yeah, that's Ringo right. Ringo did, Ringo oh, did sure, "Sentimental course. Journey." Oh, right. Of yeah. And, and, and Paul did his album of standards, which he really should have done much earlier for I his agree. love of, right. of oh, free yeah. rock and roll. They all right. loved free rock and roll music, but you didn't really know it that much in the Beatles. Mm-hmm. No, because at that time they, you know, they they really were giving the impression that they were unreconstructed rock and rollers, mm-hmm. right? You know, and they didn't mm-hmm. really give too much of a clue to to their, you know, to their musical roots before Lonnie Donegan and Elvis Presley. Mm-hmm. Well, it certainly showed with with Paul's dance hall tunes, like oh, sure. went on sixty four and, yeah. and Honey Pie, right? You know. Yep. Until there was yeah. you. Mm-hmm. Oh, sure. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 But, you know, you're bringing up the Hoagie Carmichael songs. Baltimore Oriole is one of my favorite of all of George's recordings. <laughs> I really love when he does cover other people's material. And in particular, the sax playing on that song is outstanding mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. Tom Scott. And also, you know, the way he applies his slide guitar in a way that makes perfect sense on a George Harrison recording. It's a very, it's his own arrangement of Baltimore Oriole, and I just think it's one of my favorite tracks on the album. And I love Hong Kong Blues too, but it makes you realize Baltimore Oriole, the way that George delivers it, it's such a beautiful song. And then there's the orchestration behind it too. All the work put behind that song, I really, really love. I think I like I like Hong Kong Blues a little better, especially when you hear... Hoagie Carmichael sing it in the in the movie. Um, it, it's a it's and it, the, the clips on YouTube if you know if you don't want to sit through the whole movie. But um, I, I I I really like that. Uh, I really like that song. Mm-hmm. So. Now I suspect that probably, well maybe not Ken, but uh, maybe the other <laughs> the other four of us uh, have probably listened to. Uh, to somewhere in England, at least a couple of times the last uh, the last few days, you know, sort of brushing up on it, and uh, probably should uh, get your uh, get your thoughts. And why don't we? Well, actually, let me let me start with Ken, 
and just get your overall thoughts on the album. Mm-hmm. Well, the one thing that I think might be uh, a bit shocking to the rest of you, since you know I'm a big solo fan here, yeah. um, is, that, is that Somewhere in England was the only George Harrison album, excluding electronic sound, <laughs> that, uh, yeah. I, that I was lukewarm to the first time that I heard it. I didn't really care. You know, it's a lot of the criticism that was directed towards George early on being very preachy, Mm -hmm. you know, being very spiritual, all that. You know, I didn't take to or maybe I just didn't like the songs as much when they first came out. Mm -hmm. But I've really grown to like this album a lot now. And it's funny. I have a listener uh, of mine who listens to my live show of Every Little Thing who was talking about, you know, the fact that George is so consistently strong throughout his solo career, which I agree with. And by comparison, if you you could do this with every single artist. You can list their best albums to their worst albums. And we've all seen online that people rate the Beatles albums from best to worst. And you usually get Beatles for sale as the worst. Mm-hmm. You know, which, you know, if if that's the worst they ever did. Yeah, <laughs> really. You yeah. know, it makes you realize what an amazing catalog from start to finish the whole Beatles catalog is. Right. If I was to say Somewhere in England is my least favorite George Harrison album, that's still not a criticism because mm-hmm. I love his entire body of work. But I've really grown to appreciate this album much more now than ever before because I've listened to it quite a lot in recent years and certain songs that i dismissed back then i like so much more now because i do like the spirituality in his songs i like mm-hmm. the messages in his songs writing on the wall mm. writing on the wall yeah it's mm-hmm. actually one of my my favorite songs of his because of what he's expressing in that song and not only that but the words flow so well poetically mm-hmm. that's what i love so much about that song there's a um one of the verses goes Strange we hold on to things that have no grace or power, while yeah. death holds on to us much more with every passing hour. And all the time you thought it would last, your life, your friends would always be, till they're drunk away or shot away or die away from you. Mm. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah. all about the inevitability that we're all going to die, and everything that we experience in this life is really not all that important. <laughs> it's all mm-hmm. about going on this journey together and experiencing what we feel is important and hopefully getting to a higher plane in the end and reaching God. So, but, and also, you couldn't help but think about John Lennon there. Of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Once he said, uh, you know, shot away. shot away from you. Mm-hmm. But, you know, George says so much of the same things in his songs, but uses a different angle, you mm-hmm. know, in, in the different songs. Like, between writings on the wall, also on consciousness rules, you know, those songs, that which I have lost, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's really tackling similar subjects there. And if it doesn't bother you that George is trying to share his feelings and his experiences in life and what he feels is important in being spiritual and that everything else really isn't all that important, then these words are, are, you hold them more dear to you. And you realize that, you know, he's sharing his experiences about life with us. I mean, we don't have to agree with the way he sees his life, but this is him. This is who he really is and how he really feels. And the lyrics of those songs are very powerful, you know, mm-hmm. of those three songs that I mentioned. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I just think this album is so much better than I first gave it credit for and uh, and Blood from the Clone, you know, I really enjoy because of what he's saying there about the record company. And he's not afraid to speak his mind. And he never was. That's part of the reason this why is, we love him. This is true. So if, if I was to say this is my least favorite George Harrison album, which I don't even know if that's true. Almost every George Harrison album I've loved instantly. This one took a while to really appreciate. But I'm certainly glad that I appreciate it much more so now. Life itself, like you were all saying, beautiful sentiments there. It's, um, you know, talking about God, how, you know, God is everything to him. You are the one, you are my love, all that. So um, if you appreciate songs that mean something to George in what he's saying, and then on top of all that, his guitar playing is always great. I love mm-hmm. the, the slide guitar work. I mentioned that, which I've lost before. Really yes. Great guitar, solo. Great. Yes. guitar work on that. Yeah. yeah. That's one that I would pick 
as being one of my favorite guitar solos from him in his solo career. So there's a lot there's a lot here to really uh, appreciate on Somewhere in England, and I'm glad that you know I certainly feel so much better about the album now. So mm-hmm. those are kind of my feelings about it. Okay, uh, Alan. Now you you mentioned that you were listening to the album this afternoon, right? So uh, what's your Listen, What's your verdict? Uh, your uh, your up to date verdict? I listened to it twice today. In fact, um, yeah, so did I. Yeah, um, you know, here's the thing. <laughs> I kind of like the first version of the album better than I like the finished version of the album. Mm-hmm. Um, I like Blood from from a Clone just because of its attitude and its um, uh, the certain hand gesture it represents of George <laughs> responding to his record company. Um, and there are things on it like, I mean, all those years ago. I mean, I don't, does anyone not like all those years ago, you know? Right. Um, and uh, life itself also quite beautiful. And in fact, I think one of the versions of this album came with the demo of that, didn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, oh the, uh, no. Uh, the box set version came with sa- uh, "Save the World." Save the world. Yeah. Save demo. the world. Okay. Yeah. Somewhere yeah. else on my uh, drive here, I have a demo of "Life Itself," which is really quite nice. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And the de- and and "Save the World" is another one that I would want to mention, partly because um, you know that one that one still is current. I mean, very. No very, one was talking about global yes. warming then, um, yeah. but also it has you know the the first line is so typically George. You know, save the world. Someone else might want to use yep. it. You know, yeah. <laughs> um, and. You know, it, it gets a bit noisy, the arrangement. In fact, the arrangements of all these things get a bit noisy for me. I don't know, like too much instrumentation or something. Um, whereas the, the demo is quite lovely of that. Mm-hmm. And, in fact, there is another version, a remix, which came out um, in 1985 on a Greenpeace compilation uh, charity CD, you know, to raise money for Greenpeace, a version of Save the World that is roughly the same amount of time, it's both about five minutes, the one on the album and this one, but it's different in, in a lot of ways. It, it begins differently, and I think he's toned down some of the instrumentation a bit. I mean, all those sound effects are still in there and all that stuff, but, you know, the... The wrecking of the world he's got going on halfway through the song, but somehow I like that version, the Greenpeace version, a bit better than the one on the album. I like, you know, I like Hoagy Carmichael songs, and I like him doing covers just because I'm interested in his take on other things. But I'm not mm-hmm. crazy about these arrangements of these two. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of would have to say also it may be my least favorite George Harrison album. But that said, I mean, there are a lot of things to like on it, all the, thing I, all the things I mentioned. Um, and just looking again at the track list, I mean, the stuff that Ken said about how, you know, this represents his life and what he's feeling and all that, I mean, that's obviously true, you know, and, and, it's, and it's an important point. You know, you want to know George, you want to know what he's thinking, you got to listen to these songs. I just think musically, I mean, I, I almost th- feel having heard a few demos from this album i almost feel that i'd rather hear an album of the demos with just him playing an acoustic guitar Mm. 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 yeah his demos have a very special quality to them they do Mm -hmm. when it's just him and an acoustic guitar there's nothing like it Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. which is why i like early takes so much exactly the bootlegs Yeah. yeah 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 And then again, you know, if you would put those four other songs back on it, I mean, those those songs kind of connect this album to the earlier uh, work that he did. And I I like that connection. I mean, they, they all have that certain George Harrison signature sound, you know, the way the guitar sound, the way the slide guitar mm. sounds, all that kind of thing. His his particular kind of melodies, those all work and they don't seem cluttered to me the way some of these other arrangements on this album do. So, so I have mixed feelings about it, but there are a lot of things I like and uh, yeah, that's it. 
It's incidentally <laughs> the the demo you mm-hmm. were talking about of Life Itself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the bootleg. There's a bootleg called Pirate Songs. Right. That has oh that. yes, yes. That's, oh, where it, yeah. that's where you can find it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it, I think it was compiled on. There was a, a two disc set that someone put out recently called Rarities. Um, which has yeah. a lot of you know yeah. his film mixes and single mixes and single edits and mm-hmm. and a couple of demos and things you know they've just collected a lot of the stuff that's been stray tracks on here and there um, mm-hmm. that's very handy that that must be what I listened to yeah. Mm. So. In fact, I was surprised that when um, when they they put the uh, the reissue of Somewhere in England out the. Uh, Dark Horse Years box came out, and it has the the cover on it is the original cover right. of Somewhere in England, right. but they didn't include those four rejected songs. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was going I was, I was going to I was going to mention that. Uh, yeah, which uh, is, yeah, which was really kind of weird. I mean, I'm assuming they did that because. <laughs> You know they they have reissued the track or they've issued the tracks on iTunes and stuff, but I mean it doesn't make any sense not to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah really. In, in Steve, time. Steve, what's your what's your take? Well, I, I, I kind of uh, like Alan. Um, every time I hear this album, I think back to the bootleg version because I really I really like that version a lot, and those four tracks are 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 incredibly excellent. I mean they they really are. I did listen to it today, and you know you can't get away from not having all those years ago on there. I mean, that's of course it's a great it's a great song, uh, and actually uh, it also had a kind of a mini Beatles reunion because Ringo's mm-hmm. on drums and McCart and the McCartneys, Paul and Linda are on backup vocals. So right, that's and Danny Lane is on there too. Yeah, right. so that's kind of, that's kind of nice. You know, I love the the Hoagie Carmichael track, uh, the tracks, the the the, two, the covers of those. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of good tracks here. I I don't know if I mean as Ken said, listening to a George Harrison album is always listening to you know him, you know, speak through his lyrics as he as he as he did. So I mean that that's part of it too, um, I, you know I like I like this album I, I'm I'm a, a George Harrison, I think George's stuff um, you know is um, very strong all the way through even even on his weak albums I mean Ken you said uh, you're not sure, this is probably one of his weaker albums I think um, electronic music and and and. Uh, you know, and Wonderwall are probably closer to the ones I really don't like. Um, this is not one of those I really don't like. Um, that there, I mean, there's a lot of reasons to like this. I, I do wish, because I was listening to the box set version today, mm-hmm. I really wish they had put the, why they stuck the, the demo of Save the World and not put those other tracks on there. I, yeah. I, yeah. I don't get that. I, I don't get that at all. Um, I mean, but uh, it's nice that they it's nice that they did that. But the you have to look and in, in my view you have to look at the the uh, the original version and the and the second version side by side and, and kind of make even make a playlist out of them, which actually I did today mm. on my on my phone. And uh, I mean, all the songs are all the songs are great. You know, I mean, it's a it's a it's a good album. Um, it may not be his strongest album. It's not all things must pass, but it's it's a good it's a good album. I, you know, I think uh, you know, um, um, Blood from a, Cl- a Clone is great um, because of the the little stab at the record company. Unconsciousness rules. For some reason, I really like that. You know, um, I don't know. There's just so many there's so many good things about this album. Um, you know, save the world. Save the world is is uh, a great song. I mean, it's a it's a good album all the way through. I, I I really like it. I just wish that they had gone with the original version and not made him redo redo it. Although we never would have probably gotten all those years ago out of it. But no. But but, <laughs> but uh, I mean, uh, it's it's a good album. I I think it's a good album. It's it's. George's albums uh, rarely fail with me, and this one doesn't. So, mm-hmm. yeah. By uh, the way, I, I don't want you to misunderstand when I said the weakest album, because mm-hmm. even even his weakest album is still very good. 
Yeah. You know, George was consistently strong throughout his. I, that's his what I, that's what, I, that's what I was yeah. saying. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I agree there, and uh, yeah, that's what I was basically saying. That all his albums are are good. I mean, some of them are better than others, but uh, and this one, this one is good. Um, I, I don't know if the mix is is fantastic, but yeah, uh, it's still it's still good. There, even with the remix, because I was or the remaster, which I is what I was listening to today. It's 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 a great album. It's a hmm. great album. Well, one thing about George's solo stuff, I think, is that certainly from the ones on his Dark Horse label, I think that they were produced extremely well. Mm-hmm. I, I definitely feel that way, and it shows in the remastering. It's great sound coming out of all those. I don't I don't know albums. that the remastered sound on this one sounded was all that great. Uh, it didn't knock me over like some remasters I've heard, even. Uh, you know, some of the the tracks on Pure McCartney sounded better to me than than this did, but I don't know. Um, but still, I mean, overall, it's a good album. The other thing that's curious is that they used the original co- cover on the on the uh, yeah the box set right, the remaster, which is which is strange because why you know they right why, why use the original cover and not have the four tracks? Mm-hmm. Well, why that's... use the original cover at all? I mean, why? Why not well, use the the remi- the the cover that they actually released? Yeah. It? You know that doesn't make sense either. Right. So there were there were a couple things about the about the uh, reissue that uh, I didn't particularly care for, but I mean overall it's a good album. So mm-hmm. there was one okay. other thing. It's interesting to note that all those years ago, and we all love the song and we love the sentiment and the words are just wonderful. Of course. But all those years ago, originally, was not even written for this purpose. Right. Oh, of course. Right. All those years ago had a completely different set of lyrics, and it was a song that George was offering to Ringo, yeah. which he was going to use on an album which was first going to be called Can't Fight Lightning, which became yeah, right. Stop and Smell the Roses. So mm-hmm. he reworked that song right, to put mm-hmm. these lyrics in. So. Still a, a tremendous tribute song, mm-hmm. right? But the the the, uh, the the only reason why it is a three quarter reunion, or not a three quarter, it's the reunion of the three surviving Beatles, is because they're using Ringo's drum track from the original, the original iteration of the track. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Are, are you sure about that? Yeah, they yeah, didn't go nice. back in and, and redo no. this together. Nope. Okay. All right. No, it was it was Ringo's original original drum track, and he yes. just had had uh, Paul and Linda and Denny come to Friar Park, mm-hmm. and uh, and then they they laid down their uh, their backing vocals. Okay. Uh, now, Kit, I imagine you probably have been exploring somewhere in England more recently than than some of the than perhaps Alan and Steve and me, uh, mm-hmm. because you were. Uh, Doing your research for your splendid article on uh, on, on uh, George's uh, '80s uh, rejuvenation of mm-hmm. his uh, of his career, uh, which uh, which uh, as uh, as you've mentioned, actually you got the uh, the impetus for on one of your early appearances here. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely, it was. Yeah, we had such a great conversation about it that. Yeah, it sparked the idea to to look at his whole career, and it and it's amazing how much he really did in the '80s. I mean, there was so much to cover because people tended to think after gone, you know, between Gone Tropo and Cloud Nine, that he didn't do that much. Not true, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, and so it was really interesting to see that. But yeah, somewhere in England, this this was interesting because, as you said, I was revisiting this right. for this article as well, and. I'll I'll tell you, I went through kind of a personal transformation with this album because the first time I heard it, you know, this was many years ago, and I did not know the background. I mean, I knew, of course, it had been released after John Lennon's death, but I Mm -hmm. didn't know the whole story about how he, you know, the first version was rejected by the record company and all. So I remember listening to that album for the first time, and, you know, and it starts right off with Blood from a Clone, and I thought, what the hell is this? I mean, mean, it was so angry, and, and, you know, and I I just, that really set the tone for me for for the rest of the album, and I just thought, oh, what a negative, you know. Know, this is just this whole album is just full of negativity and and you know well of course as I got older and wiser and I, yes. I learned the whole story 
you know, I think this is a case where it, when you know the background of the album, it really enhances your appreciation of it. Because once I learned all that, I thought, oh, OK, <laughs> you know, now I see what he was doing from Blood from a Clone. And as as many of you have said, I mean, it's actually pretty clever. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the lyrics are so biting. You know? And then when you think of something like uh, Writings on the Wall. I mean, it takes on such, you know, a great more, it, it takes on a great deal of meaning mm. when you understand the circumstances. Um, and so today, I really, you know, I'm not saying this is one of my favorite albums of his. I mean, as mm. Steve said, it's not All Things Must Pass. For me, it's not 33 and a third. It's not Cloud Nine. But right. it, and it, you know, it's a bit uneven, but there are some great moments on there and, and so many, you know, many of you have already touched on them. Uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, life itself, writings on the wall. Uh, I also want to say there, there are two, I think MVPs on, on this album. And one can already mention Tom Scott. Okay. Uh, Tom Scott was uh, also, I thought his solo on on consciousness rules was, uh, was terrific uh, in mm-hmm. addition to George's solo and uh, and also Willie Weeks. Um, I thought it was oh, yeah. on that which I have lost. Great stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So you know, George was was fortunate enough that he was able to surround himself with the best of the best. Um, and those are two. You know, Tom Scott and Willie Weeks were were definitely examples of that. Yeah. I mean, so I I think they were MVPs as well. Um, on the album, you know, um, Alan. I as as you were giving your assessment, you you I've had sort of an epiphany because you mentioned the Hoagie Carmichael p- covers, and you know I never quite connected to them, and I always wondered why. And when you said overarranged, I thought that's mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. You nailed it um, because I love his covers. I mean, George has done a number of covers, but. I agree that the arrangements on them were just too busy, yeah. you know, and uh, and I think that's why I never quite connected to them. They're great songs. He sings them well. Um, I mean, obviously, they're great songs. They're Hoagie Carmichael. But but, yeah, I think the arrangement could have been a little more sparse, something yeah. to, to let those wonderful lyrics really shine through. Mm-hmm. So uh, mm-hmm. so thank you for clarifying that for Anytime. me. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Because I seriously, I always thought, you know, why do I not like this as much as I should? But uh, Save the World, uh, there's been a little discussion of that. I, I mean, that is such an interesting song because you think, you know, just by the title, you think, oh, this is going to be this, you know, this optimistic, let's go out and change the world. And it's not mm-hmm. quite like that, you know, mm-hmm. singing, we're at the mercy of so few with evil hearts determined to reduce this planet to hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's go save it. You know, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> he's very honest, let's put it that way. Um, mm-hmm. But it fits in with the other songs that, you know, Ken, you have mentioned, you know, that about his belief in God, that his spirituality will, you know, that spirituality will will get us through. You know, that's, that's you know, his, his expression. And so it does sort of fit in with the other like writings on the wall or life itself or you know and so i i now have a lot more appreciation um for the album oh and i forgot to mention teardrops i agree al that was a, a highlight too it's, yeah uh, yeah that's a great song and and uh you know and, and probably yeah one of the more accessible ones uh for sure and of course all those years ago um you know outstanding and so i i think that perhaps it's an album and maybe this is why it didn't do as well i think it was the first album of his not to go gold in america i think i I mentioned that in my article Mm -hmm. um and perhaps because this does merit repeated listenings you know i don't think this is an album that you you and you know immediately connect with you know i think yeah I think is there are some songs on here that are so rich in, in meaning mm. that you do have to listen to them a few times to, to quotes, get it. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and as I said, knowing the background, but of course, when it came out in 81, that wasn't, you know, no, not everybody knew the full background. So, right. um, but yeah, so I think that might be it, that maybe some of it just wasn't as immediately accessible as, as some of, you know, perhaps, you know, his past work was. So even though it it was, you know, as I mentioned, a little uneven, it's still uh, definitely, I like it 
you know, it's it's one of the albums. I I I guess I put it further down the list of the albums mm-hmm. I like of his, but not too for too much further down the list. I mean, you know, as you said, electronic sounds, all that. I, yeah, I, I didn't connect. <laughs> <laughs> However, yeah. I I do love Wonderwall music, so there mm-hmm. I disagree with with uh, Steve. But mm-hmm. you like it? Do you like Wonderwall music better than this? I find it much. I find it very interesting because there's a lot more of his Indian music right there, mm-hmm. and you only got a taste of that in the Beatles through a few songs. Right. So mm-hmm. if you wanted George to dabble more in that, you got it right there. And George mm-hmm. never put out an all Indian album. He would produce Ravi Shankar. But he would never do all Indian music himself. So for that, I, I find Wonderwall music very interesting. And it's not all Indian music, obviously. No. But no. I do find it very interesting as scoring music. And also, I, I love the arrangements of the songs, whether it all comes down to the Indian musicians and what they came up with. However it was done, it's it's a very interesting album. Mm-hmm. Mm, I, 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 I can't put... Wonderwall ahead of ahead of this uh, under no. I don't know if I'm putting it ahead of it, but you know, like Kit said, there are certain albums that take a while to grow on you, and mm-hmm. Somewhere in England is one of those albums. Definitely. You know, and, and and like what I've said about Living in the Material World, which is my favorite album, a lot of right. people probably they need to listen to that a lot before they get the messages in George's songs. Mm-hmm. They're, right. They're not not every song is is what is life and and got my mind set on you in very instant catchy songs of right. George's the the ones that are more spiritual and more philosophical you got to take the time and listen to what he's saying and listen several times over before you can appreciate it absolutely and true somewhere in england is one of those albums for me yep. and and especially you know back Back then, when we were, you know, a lot younger, um, songs like Writings on the Wall and um, from the Beatle years, Within You, Without You, uh, songs like that, we tended to uh, not really understand them or feel that they were uh, the answers at the end, another another Mm -hmm. one, Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, felt that they were "Quote unquote preachy." Right. Well, you know, you get you get to a you know a more a more mature age, and uh, and you can actually really appreciate the uh, the sentiments in those songs. Mm-hmm. You can relate much more to what George is saying as you get older. Ab- absolutely. Yes. Certainly, yeah. you know, when you think about what he was saying and within you, without you. Yes. You know, how how deep a message that is. <laughs> and mm-hmm. and if you're a teenager listening to that, that's gonna oh. go over your head. Oh, you know? absolutely. You know, so. that was that was the the one the one track on Sgt. Pepper and you know, we always thought that what the you know, the little titter of laughter that's at the end there, you mm-hmm. know, was put there specifically because it was such a boring song. That 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 sort of thing. Right. You know, it's uh, you know, it's it's just a matter of uh, of uh, of growing into. I think uh, uh, we probably had to grow into a lot of George's uh, a lot of George's music. As a matter of fact, Kit, you'll get it. You'll get a kick out of this. I got to give you one more quote mm-hmm. from my from my review of Somewhere in England from Beatle Ooh. Fan in 1981. Yeah. <clears throat> Speaking of chaff. Blood from, a, from a, Blood from a Clone is a spiteful, narrow-minded attack on Warners, the record industry, and you and me for wanting something more than the same old cliches and tired arrangements. Uh, it's, it's beneath a man who, who preaches about love of God and wanting to save the world to stoop to cheap mudslinging like this. Huh. Now, see, what do you, okay. what do you think of that? Yeah, well, you know what? Though? That's what I. That's sort of what I initially thought. You know, when I first heard this album. I mean, seriously. I mean, maybe not not all of that, but I mean, some of it. You know, yeah. That I thought, how? You know, what? Wait a minute. This is the yeah, my sweet lord. Uh, you know, what is life? We I mean, what is that? This is just pure anger and spite and all that. And I think that was that was my initial reaction too. And and mm-hmm. I think that that p- colored my perception of the re- initially of the rest of the album. So so I mean we laugh, but I mean that was kind of my reaction when I first heard it. 
Mm-hmm. Perhaps yeah. not that extreme, but not that extreme, but but yeah, but I kind of thought the same thing. Like, how dare he put the, you know, how could he put this negativity on this album, you know? Yeah. So Very true. Yeah. Most and, fans, uh, most fans actually, when it comes to George's solo career, especially the mainstream fans, they tend to like the more commercial, sure, right, the more upbeat. You know, something like All Things Must Pass, while it was very spiritual on, on many of the songs. Mm-hmm. Or, or like Kit mentioned, 33 and a third, a lot of lightheartedness in there, poking fun at My Sweet Lord in this song and yep. at Cracker Box Palace. Or something like Cloud Nine. The, the general public, the mainstream audience, tends to gravitate to that stuff more. And I think the more loyal, hardcore, if you want to call them, of mm-hmm. George's fans understands the full scope of his music and what he was saying and likes the more in-depth songs, mm-hmm. like like the ones on Living in the Material World <laughs> or, right. or or this one, um, you know, Somewhere in England. Yeah. Well, as I said, you know, one day you just wake up and you think, I get it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you're older, like, I get what he was saying now, you know. <laughs> well, I should own up briefly because we're running out of time but i should own up to my my current thoughts on Mm -hmm. uh on this album as opposed to this screed from 1981 Mm -hmm. (laughs) and uh uh, basically it's very similar to uh to your most of your thoughts it's not in i would say it's not in the the uh, my personal pantheon of the let's say the single single disc George Harrison album so it's not mm-hmm. in up there with with 33 and a third or cloud nine or brainwashed or perhaps even uh, uh, living in the material world uh, but it's um, it, it certainly has it's it's certainly aged much better than I had expected for much the same reason that I spoke of uh, just before that a lot of those, those songs that we considered to be preachy at that time, one can relate much easier to them, you Mm -hmm. know, with a more mature uh, viewpoint and actually blood from a clone turned out to be kind of very prescient because mm-hmm. one could uh, one could very easily say that the uh, you know the well of course the music business has always been somewhat in that vein but certainly in the 36 years since this album came out that's mm-hmm. been pretty much the hallmark of the business has been mm-hmm. just been you know chasing one uh, you know whatever whatever the the trend of the moment is you know that's what they uh, that's what they want, mm-hmm. and so in uh, to a great degree, it's uh, it's kind of a prescient tune, but it's um, mm-hmm. you know, overall. You know, mm-hmm. I think it's kind of always been that way. There's always been a lot of formula out there. Oh, and sure. Record companies once once you know an artist puts out a hit record that sounds a certain way, they want another one to follow that's close to it. Oh, sure. It's always been like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can go back to the you know the earliest days of rock and roll, or even before, but um, but certainly from the from the eighties beyond, where you know where the the business became much more corporate, it's really been you know just out of hand, where it's they've just simply been chasing whatever whatever the flavor of the moment is, mm-hmm. that that sort of thing. But you know, overall, it's uh, it's a it's a it's a, a nice it's a very pleasant album. But again, I you know I would say I think we're pretty much unanimous in mm-hmm. saying that it's it's not one that we would put in the the pantheon of Harrison albums. No, mm-hmm. probably not. Yeah, no, abs- mm-hmm. absolutely. But uh, mm-hmm. but certainly uh, certainly one that's. Uh, you know that's that that's aged fairly well. So I think the the clock has pretty much got us again. So <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's time to uh, to wrap it up. And um, uh, Steve, why don't you let us know how you can contact us? You can download our shows at beetlesexaminer.podbean.com or on YouTube. We have actually two 
there's two places on YouTube. Um, we have a things we said today page, and we also uh, and I also put the shows on my page. And if you search uh, things we said today, uh, Beatles Radio, you'll find them. Uh, you can contact us by writing things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. You can also we also have individual Facebook pages where you can uh, talk to us. The show has a a Facebook p- uh, page of its own. Things we said today, Beatles Radio fans, um, and you you can find us there. You can leave comments, you can complain, you can do whatever you want, um, and we will very likely respond to you. Because we are good people, and we like people to write to us, and we like to write back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and Alan, uh, how do people contact you? Oh, probably by Facebook, either under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remix. It's probably the best way. Mm-hmm. Uh, with me, it's a very similar. Uh, Facebook, Al Sussman, Twitter, A at ASUSS49 or through Beetle Fan Magazine, www.beetlefan.com or uh, www.paradingpress.com for Changing Times, 101 Days to Shape the Generation. Kit, how do uh, people get in touch with you? Well, you can uh, look me up on my website, uh, kiddotool.com. Uh, you can find me on Facebook under under my name and on Twitter um, at Kiddo Tool, all one word. And uh, and I should also mention that uh, by the time probably this will be released or a couple of days after, uh, my Deep Beatles column is returning um, to something else reviews this weekend. I had to go on a longer hiatus than I had uh, planned, but it's coming this weekend. So uh, so check it out. And you also have, well, actually, again, by the time this um, this drops, uh, it probably will be archived, but you have a Facebook Live event coming up this Wednesday evening. That's right, at uh, 6.30 Eastern. So uh, so if you missed it, if you've heard the show and you've missed it, just uh, check out my Facebook page and it'll be archived there. Mm-hmm. And Ken, what's uh, what's going on with your, uh, with your website and with uh, every little thing? Well, first of all, you can reach me on my Facebook page at Ken Michaels, and I also have an email address at everylittlething at att.net. My website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com, features interviews with everybody on this panel right now. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So if you want to hear interviews with any of us, me talking to Al or Steve or Alan or Kit, it's all there on the website on my interview pages. There's also a Beatles trivia and games page where you can win one of nine prizes every single week. They're all tremendous prizes. One of them happens to be Kit's book, Songs You Were Singing. And not only that, this is going to make everybody run to my website. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you could also win, along with Kit's book, a Kit O'Toole tote bag. Mm-hmm. So Ooh, yes. that yep. goes along with that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I also should mention that for anyone that wants to hear my radio show, every little thing, and they don't want to have to listen at a specific time to the, any of the radio stations that carry it, there's a website called globaltexanchronicles.com where you can stream many of my archive shows there whenever you want. Mm. And there's almost always one that gets posted every single week. So again, that's globaltexanchronicles.com. Mm. My newest show is an hour of soundtrack music, group and solo, Ooh. which is going to be on a lot of radio stations this coming week. And soon to be on Global Texan Chronicles. So that's about it. Okay. Al, can, can, can I add my I forgot my email address? Uh, Beatlesexaminer yeah. at gmail dot com. Um, and uh, like I have a, a Facebook page and also a, a Beatles news group, Beatles news and commentary on Facebook uh, that you're welcome to join. So right, and I think you've also got. Don't you also have a separate one where you do uh, <clears throat> non Beatles uh, discussion? Um, do I? <laughs> oh, I thought, uh, I, I thought you had a I do so one I do so well. I have I have several blogs, um, but uh, I'm not going to take the time and, and okay. <laughs> I'm all. I do have a I do have a Beatles blog, Beatles News Insider that I I do every so often, which uh, will pop up on my Facebook page and on uh, Beatles News and Commentary. So. Ah, I see. Okay, that's great. 
Uh, all righty. Well, the as I said, the clock uh, the clock has got us again. <laughs> We had, had two items to uh, to cover, and uh, and as usual, we went way we went way over time. But anyway, it's been a fascinating uh, show as always. Kit, thanks once again for for joining us. It's my and pleasure, sure, and I'm sure you'll uh, you'll uh, we'll have you back very very soon. Sounds good. And for Kid O'Toole and Steve Marinucci and Alan Cozen and Ken Michaels, this is Al Sussman. And thank you for, uh, for listening to Things We Said Today, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.